Well, thanks for that kind introduction, uh, Brian. And it's really a great honor for me to, uh, to be the Paul Homer lecturer here at the McLaurin CSF. And it's wonderful to be back in Minnesota. I should say just a word about Paul Homer because he, uh, he's a man who played a very important role in my own life. And in fact, it was one of the reasons that I happily accepted this invitation. I first met Paul when he interviewed me for a Danforth Fellowship. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, a fellowship that I later won, so he must have liked me. I also found out later on that uh, he, unbeknownst to me, he was the reader for the press for the very first book that I ever published. And uh, in my years at Yale, although I was in philosophy and not in the divinity school, I would regularly go by Paul Homer's office, and he was unfailingly a source of advice and counsel and wisdom about many issues, philosophical and personal, so I owe him a lot. In fact, uh, I'll just mention tonight, uh, some of you who, if you're interested in Paul Homer's work, that three volumes of his unpublished writings are going to appear within a year from Whiff and Stock. I know the people involved in this project, and it's going to be a very, uh, they're going to be good books, so anyway. Uh, and I thought it might be appropriate, since Paul Homer was a Kierkegaard scholar, and I'm sort of known somewhat for my work on Kierkegaard, although I'm not going to talk about Kierkegaard tonight, but I thought I might begin with the Kierkegaard story. It's a story that says something about the fact that we don't always know who we are. We don't always know what it means to be a human being, and we don't always, always know something about ourselves. Kierkegaard tells the story of a peasant who won a small lottery prize. And he went into town, and he blew a big part of it on some fancy clothes, uh, particularly some really fancy breeches, which he'd never worn these before. And then he blew the rest of it, sadly, on alcohol, got roaringly drunk, uh, fell asleep, and lay down in the middle of the road. Uh, a little later, a nobleman came by in a carriage, and this guy is lying in the middle of the road, and the nobleman says, get up, wake up, I'm about to run over your legs. The peasant woke up, looked down at the fancy britches, and said, go ahead, they're not my legs. <laughs> he didn't recognize himself because of the pants. Who are we? Until at least the 19th century, there was, I think, a consensus among Christian thinkers that some form of mind-body, or we might say soul-body dualism, constituted the ontological truth about human beings. Thomas Aquinas and John Calvin will serve as enormously influential but representative illustrations. Here's Aquinas. Man is composed of a spiritual and a corporeal substance. Calvin is just as clear. The soul is an incorporeal substance. I hope you all do have a copy of the handout, which is a kind of outline. It will help you to follow, I hope, what I have to say. Now, this anthropological dualism is far from being an esoteric, abstract, philosophical doctrine because it bears directly on what happens to human persons or what could happen to human persons after death. When the Heidelberg Catechism says... My only comfort in life and death is that I belong, body and soul, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. This reference to body and soul is not merely a poetic flourish. We know that because the same catechism says a little later, explaining the resurrection, that not only will my soul be taken immediately after this life to Christ its head, but even my flesh, raised by the power of Christ, will be reunited with my soul and made like Christ's glorious body. Now, the Catechism's view of what happens at death is by no means unique or unusual. I think it reflects the standard way most Christians have thought about such things going all the way back to the Church Fathers. At death, the believer is, is supposed to be immediately present with the Lord, but nevertheless looks forward to a future bodily resurrection in which the body will be raised from the grave. And I think it's fairly obvious that this eschatological picture, this picture of the last things, presupposes some sort of dualism. We are not simply our bodies. Now, this consensus about Christian anthropology eroded first in the 19th century under the influence of philosophical idealism, which tended to reject bodily resurrection by reinterpreting bodily resurrection as a symbolic expression of immortality. So that was the 19th century. Uh, 
But in the 20th century, it's eroded under the influence of materialism. Naturally, philosophical materialism about human persons leaves no room for an intermediate disembodied state. The erosion in the last 50 years has become an avalanche as Christian theologians, biblical scholars, philosophers, and scientists have all joined in denunciations of dualism. Recently, for example, scholars such as Fuller theologian Nancy Murphy and biblical scholar Joel Green have joined in the chorus. Now, the alternative to dualism that these people defend is a position they describe as non-reductive materialism or sometimes non-reductive physicalism. I think there are a number of different motives for this repudiation of the traditional Christian view. One motive seems to be philosophical, and I'm a philosopher so I know all about this. Dualism is massively unpopular among contemporary philosophers. The most common philosophical objections are linked to the dualistic claim that souls and bodies can interact with each other. Many philosophers think that interaction between a material and a non-material reality is impossible or even unintelligible. Some object that positing a non-material mind or soul that has effects in the physical world would violate the conservation of matter and energy or they simply argue flatly for what they call the causal closure of the physical, by which they mean that only physical things can have effects in the physical world. So that's one type of objection. The second type of objection stems from new readings of biblical materials. Many biblical scholars have shifted away from a traditional reading of the Bible as teaching a dualistic anthropology towards the claim that the thrust of the biblical view of the human person is unitary or monistic. On this, often, for example, it's said that the Hebraic view of the person is holistic and unitary, seeing humans as unified bodily beings. Dualism is seen as a Greek perspective that early Christians absorbed from their culture and then projected back onto the biblical materials. So the view that the Bible teaches a form of dualism is alleged to be the result of reading the Bible through Greek philosophical lenses. A third type of objection stems from science. Neuroscience today often is seen as affirming the basic unity of the human person and the body because it makes clear how strongly dependent our mental lives are on neural activity. Tonight I'm going to argue that none of these three reasons for abandoning dualism is really very strong. I'm just going to say very little but not very much about the first two reasons. Uh, Mostly I want to talk about the third, the scientific type of reason. So first, something about the philosophical issues. The philosophical arguments for abandoning dualism seem to me to be weak, especially for Christians. Anyone who's committed to theism and who believes in a creator God must reject the claim that a non-physical entity cannot act causally in the physical world. Nor is it easy to see how a theist, much less a Christian who accepts the possibility and actuality of miracles, as many traditional Christians do, could accept the idea of the, quote, causal closure of the physical. Much of the popularity among philosophers uh, that materialism enjoys about human beings surely reflects the fact that these philosophers are atheists and materialists. It's hardly surprising that those who are committed to the view that only physical things exist will say that human beings must be physical, because we surely exist. Christians then should not be moved by worries about whether a non-physical reality can interact with physical entities. As to how the interaction occurs, there may be a genuine element of mystery, but mystery is not always problematic. It seems to be true that when we reach basic causal laws, even within the physical world, there is mystery. We know that matter behaves in a certain way, but once we reach bedrock, we can say little about why matter behaves in that way, once we reach the basic laws of nature. Theists, of course, might say that the basic laws of nature reflect God's sovereign creative will, but that goes well beyond what scientists can say. In a similar manner, I think dualists, mind-body dualists, might say that it's simply a basic feature of the natural world, that human minds can affect human bodies and vice versa even if we can't say exactly how the causal interaction takes place. Actually, I think it would be very instructive if Christian thinkers who are jumping on board the materialism bandwagon 
would pay more attention to the debates currently raging in the secular philosophical arena between different forms of materialism. Because when one looks carefully at the arguments, it becomes clear that contemporary secular materialists are sure that some form of materialism must be true. However, this a priori confidence that some form of materialism must be true goes hand in hand with deep uncertainty about which form of materialism is true, even bafflement as to how any form of materialism could be true. Each form of materialism currently being defended makes devastating criticisms of the other forms. Uh, this has even led to a school of thought uh, charmingly called the New Mysterians. Sounds like a rock group. That's not an accident. They were actually named after a rock group. Uh, the New Mysterians are a group of philosophers who claim that though materialism is true, it's a mystery. We humans will never understand how it can be true. They say that the mind-body relation is, quote, cognitively closed to us humans. It's simply a deep mystery, something we have to accept, you might say, on faith, I guess. <laughs> the philosophical case for materialism, then, is hardly a slam dunk. Christians who jump onto the materialist bandwagon should soberly consider the fact that many atheistic materialists who have no other choice than to affirm some form of materialism honestly admit that their position faces daunting problems. Let me move now to talk about biblical and theological objections. I think contemporary biblical scholarship has made very helpful points here with respect to biblical anthropology. One is that the words used by the various biblical writers for the different parts or aspects of the human person carry a variety of meanings in different biblical contexts. Thus, one cannot assume that a biblical writer who uses a term such as soul or spirit means exactly the same thing that a different biblical writer might mean, much less the same thing that a Greek philosopher might mean by those terms. So when the biblical writer describes human persons as consisting of spirit, soul, and body, as in 1 Thessalonians, this doesn't necessarily mean that humans are composed of three distinct substances any more than the reference to heart, soul, mind, and strength in Mark implies that humans are composed of four parts. It seems fair to say, however, that in, if we look at the history of the Christian church, that theologians have not always been sensitive to these differences. And I think it's true, they have sometimes imported meaning to biblical texts that the original writers did not have in view. For example, although many Christian theologians have taught a kind of dualism in, which includes a belief in natural immortality, that the soul is a kind of naturally immortal uh, entity, I think it's pretty clear the biblical writers did not believe anything like this. There is no doctrine of natural immortality uh, in the Bible. The biblical writers see the survival of the soul, if there is any soul to survive, as completely dependent on God and God's supernatural power. It's not a fact about us. Uh, but of course, there have been theologians, and perhaps they were under the influence of Greek, say, Platonic views of the soul, who assumed that when the Bible referred to the soul, it was speaking of a naturally immortal substance. And I think that was an error. A second major contribution of contemporary biblical scholarship has been to underline the fact that the major thrust of biblical anthropology is towards wholeness. I think that's absolutely true. The Bible always views human beings as unitary beings. We are bodily souls. And thus it makes sense that the final biblical hope is not for a disembodied afterlife. It is for a bodily resurrection. But this emphasis on the unity of the person, including the body, I'm going to try and show, is compatible with some forms of dualism. It may not be compatible with Platonic dualism, but there are other versions of dualism. Humans are unified, but that unity may be a functional unity. That includes some distinctness in the parts. I think the claim that contemporary biblical scholarship has made a solid case that human beings are nothing but their bodies is at best an exaggeration. Let, let me ju just say this, however, as a kind of footnote to everything I'm saying tonight. I'm arguing and defending a view which I think is the right view, 
But I wouldn't want to suggest that the people I'm disagreeing with are any less Christian than I am. I have good friends who hold these views that I'm disagreeing with tonight, deeply Christian people. So this is not an issue that I would use as a test of orthodoxy or anything like that. Nevertheless, it's important to think hard about these and to try to do the best we can to get things right. But I, I think that word is, uh, is worth making. Anyway, I would recommend, for example, if you want a good treatment of biblical uh, views, I would recommend John Cooper's book, Body, Soul, and Life Everlasting, Biblical Anthropology in the Monism-Dualism Debate. Cooper, in this book, admits that the anthropological picture in the Old Testament is rather unclear, but even there, the biblical writers are far from holding any form of materialism in the modern sense. It may be wrong to project Platonic dualism back onto the Bible, but it's equally wrong to project contemporary materialism back into the Bible, just as anachronistic. Uh, when we get to the New Testament, the picture is more clearly dualistic, according to Cooper. The crucial passages are those that deal with what happens after death. There are three main views about what happens or what could happen to us after death that have been defended. This is within the context of Christian theology, of course, uh, there are lots of atheists who think that what happens after death is you cease to be. That's what happens, but I'm not talking about them here. Uh, th these are the three main views. Uh, a gap theory. At death, the believer ce temporarily ceases to exist until the resurrection, which is a future event. Second possible view, immediate resurrection. Immediately after death, the believer is resurrected, obviously not in our space-time world, but in some other space-time world that has no temporal spatial relationships to ours. It's incommensurable with our world. And then finally, the traditional view that there will be a future resurrection in our space-time, but the believer continues to exist with Christ between the time of death and the time of that future resurrection. Cooper argues that there are some scriptural passages consistent with the gap theory, and there are others that are consistent with the immediate resurrection theory. Each, however, is contradicted by the passages which are consistent with the passages consistent with the other view. And there are no passages that plainly teach either of those two views. The third view, the traditional view, belief that the resurrection is a future event with the deceased enjoying communion with Christ between death and the resurrection, is the only view that is consistent with all of the scriptural evidence and that seems to be plainly taught in some passages. And this view, I think, clearly presupposes a dualistic ontology, since a person must be distinct from his or her body to exist between the biological death of that body and the resurrection of that body. If you exist when your body doesn't exist, you are not identical to your body. Dualism, however, is not just important in making sense of that intermediate state between death and the resurrection. It's also arguable that without a dualistic ontology, the resurrection itself is not possible, since without a continuously existing person, it's not clear what makes the resurrected body to be my body. There are special difficulties here for the immediate resurrection view, since it's very unclear how this new resurrected body that has no spatio-temporal uh, continuity with my body now could be identical to my body. Uh, Anyone who thinks that upon death I am immediately resurrected in a new body in some other space-time world cannot believe that I am identical to this body, the body that I had prior to my death, since that body is going to be decomposing while I enjoy my new body. Advocates of immediate resurrection may hold that I cannot exist without some body, or I have to have a body to exist, but that doesn't mean that I'm identical to my current body, so it's still not full-fledged materialism. I conclude that biblical anthropology taken as a whole is far from supporting any form of materialism, even non-reductive materialism in its view of human persons. But it is true, as I said before, the biblical writers emphasize the unity of the person and they emphasize the importance and value of the body for the human self. These themes do distinguish biblical views of the self from Platonic dualism, which sees the body as unimportant or even bad. Uh, the, Pla the Platonist says it'll be a good thing to be rid of the body, to get rid of that old filthy material thing. Uh, 
Um, the biblical view, however, may be quite consistent with some other forms of dualism. But let's turn now to the scientific problems with dualism, the ones that I think are most uh, influential. In fact, I think, I suspect it's the desire to be consistent with scientific findings that has motivated the philosophical and theological biblical objections that I've just talked about. So what exactly are the scientific findings that are alleged to support some form of materialism? The main claim, I think, is that contemporary neuroscience supports the total dependence of mental activity on neural activity. Contemporary neuroscience has successfully pursued a strategy of localization in which particular mental functions are associated with particular regions of the brain. Contemporary brain scanning research shows, for example, a correlation between neural activities in certain regions of the brain and various forms of mental activity. Um, even going so far as those making claims that when people pray or meditate, there are particular regions of the brain that carry out these tasks or are involved. Uh, uh, Malcolm Jeeves, who's a, a, an outstanding Christian neuro, neuroscientist and I'm proud to claim as a, a, a good friend, Malcolm Jeeves summarizes these findings very clearly. He says, the same take-home message emerged from all of these studies, referring to a lot of studies he summarized in this book, whether human or animal, namely the remarkable localization of function in the brain and the specificity of the neural substrate underlying mental events. As each event occurred, mind and brain were seen to be ever more tightly linked together. So I take those findings to be firm, well-established findings. But what exactly do they mean? Certainly they imply that the brain is profoundly important for our mental life. Is this really a new discovery? I think the answer is yes and no. We now have a vastly different picture of the particular ways our mental life depends on the brain that we had in the past. This knowledge is very valuable both for medical science and for understanding the relation between particular kinds of mental functioning such as say emotion or perception or cognition and particular regions of the brain. But when we reflect on these findings, to some degree, it is a matter of filling in the details. The details are fascinating, they're important, but in a crucial respect, they don't fundamentally alter our understanding of the relation between mind and brain. We have known for a very long time that mental life can be drastically changed or even ended, as far as earthly life goes, by bashing in a person's skull. We know a lot more details about the degree and extent of the dependence of the mind on the brain than we did, but it's far from clear that these quantitative increases in our knowledge require a fundamental qualitative change in our understanding of the relation between mind and brain. Certainly, the mind depends in fundamental ways upon the brain, but we've known for a long time that the mind depends upon the brain to some degree, we know now that this dependence is perhaps more extensive and deeper than we would have guessed. But does this dependence imply that mind and brain are simply identical? Are you your brain? I'm going to argue that there are forms of dualism that are completely consistent with even the most extensive uh, dependence of mental functioning on the brain that we can even imagine. In other words, even if the uh, neuroscientist succeeds beyond his or her fondest dreams, that there are still uh, forms of dualism that will be compatible with those scientific findings. Um, there are obviously many different ways of classifying types of dualism. I want to focus right now on, uh, on a, a kind of dualism that I think will do justice to the biblical findings of the emphasis on the unity of the person as well as the scientific research. The account I, I'm going to give is one that understands us human beings as embodied agents. We are bodily souls. To understand it, we must think both about what it means to be an agent and what does it mean to be embodied. There are obviously many different ways of classifying types of dualism, uh, but let's think uh, for the moment about two different kinds of dualism. One option is to think of the body and the soul as two distinct things, two distinct parts that together compose a human person. A second option is to think of the soul simply as the true person or self. 
The first option can be found in Thomas Aquinas, who sees the human person as a unified being formed by body and soul, both of which are essential to the person's identity. Aquinas thinks the body is so important that between death and the resurrection, although your soul continues to exist, technically you don't, because you need your body to, to really exist. But there's a part of you that exists, namely your soul. Um, so on this kind of view, the soul is a part of a person, an entity that together with another entity, the body, forms the person. Now, to be sure, a person on Aquinas' view is not a mere aggregate. Soul and body, as he sees them, are naturally fitted to each other. He says the soul is, quote, the form of the body. Without the soul, the person's body isn't even strictly his or her body. It's just a corpse. Without the body, the soul, while it can continue to exist, cannot carry out all of its functions. Uh, it can't, so to speak, do the things it was supposed to be. Nevertheless, on Aquinas' view, to refer to the soul is not to refer to me, it's to refer to a part of me. The other alternative, the other form of dualism, can be found in Descartes, the famous father of modern philosophy, who identifies the person with the soul understood as a, quote, thinking thing. Descartes is not claiming that persons are simply intellectual here because for him sensations and emotions are also forms of thinking. They all count. Anything that's part of your consciousness counts as thinking for Descartes. So for Descartes, to refer to the soul is simply to refer to the self. I am my soul. Or to put it differently, the, the term soul refers to what I am speaking of when I use the term I to refer to me. For Descartes, a person has a body and has a particularly intimate relation with the body, but the body is not, for Descartes, an essential part of the self. Descartes therefore thinks that it is possible, by God's omnipotence, for a person to continue to exist after death without a body. So for Descartes, the soul is not really a part of me, it's just me. I am a soul. It's not a thing inside me, it's me. Now I think there's something attractive about both of these positions for Christians. The view of Aquinas takes account of the biblical view that humans are bodily beings. It helps us understand the importance of the bodily resurrection for Christians. You might think that therefore we should just reject the Cartesian view if we want to be Christian dualists and go with Thomas Aquinas. But I've become convinced that there is something right about the Cartesian picture also. Perhaps if we modify and tweak these two views, we can come up with a view that incorporates what's good about each. What's right about the Cartesian picture is this. To ask whether humans have souls is not to ask whether they have a peculiar kind of ghostly entity floating around inside them. Rather, to ask whether we have souls is to ask, what kinds of things are we? What kind of thing is a human person? From Descartes' point of view, if we speak strictly, we should not say that we have souls, but that we are souls. Or if the language of souls has become impossibly confused and obscure, we should simply drop it and say we are selves, because I think that's what the Cartesian language amounts to. Now, I think the biblical emphasis on the value of the body can be retained by borrowing from Aquinas the insight that we are the kinds of souls that require bodies to function as they should function. We are selves, to be sure, but we are bodily selves, and we cannot be what we were intended to be without bodies. We are bodily souls, souls that exist in a bodily form or manner. Paradoxically, Thinking of my soul as myself rather than a part of myself, I think allows for a more intimate relation between body and soul than the alternative. For it allows me to think of the body not as a part of myself, but rather the manner in which I exist as a soul. I am a bodily self. I'm a soul, but I am not like an angel, a pure spirit. Rather, I'm an incarnated, a bodily self or soul. So in this view, the relationship between soul and body, or self and body, can be as intimate as you like. 
One might believe, for example, that the self simply can't exist at all without a body that is its form of being. Or we might hold that the self cannot exist in the fullest and richest sense without a body, which is, I take it to be Aquinas' view. On that view, the self can exist between death and the resurrection, but perhaps cannot carry out all its functions if it doesn't exist as it's intended to in a bodily form. Human salvation without resurrected bodies would be incomplete. Now one might ask here, if self and body are so intimately related, why not opt for materialism? Why shouldn't we simply identify a person with his or her body? Uh, and I think the answer is, a person as a self must be distinguished from his or her body simply because a person has characteristics qua self that the person does not have qua body. Identity is a necessary relation. If I'm identical to my body, then it's necessarily true that what is true of my body is also true of me, and what's true of me is true of my body. So if it were true that a person's self were identical to the person's body, it would be a necessary truth that if the person's body is decomposing in a grave, the person would be decomposing in a grave. If it is even logically possible for me to exist when my current body has ceased to exist, I am not identical to my current body. Now some Christian philosophers agree that a person is not identical to his or her body, but they think we should say that a person is composed of or constituted by his or her body. And that's a view that I have some sympathy for. On this view, I would argue that such a, quote, constitution view of the self and the relationship of the self and the body still counts as at least a kind of dualism. We could view the constitution view as a kind of dualism which sees having somebody as essential to my existence. If this were the correct view, then we might, apt for, uh, we might opt for the uh, gap theory, or we could suppose that God gives the self some sort of temporary body during the intermediate state between death and the resurrection. But even if something like this were the case, even if it's not possible for a human being to exist without a body, we would still have to distinguish the person from the person's current body. It would just be the case now that having a body would be an essential property of a human soul. So if the body is the form in which the soul exists, why should we continue to talk about soul and body as if they were two distinct entities? Isn't it misleading to talk of soul and body as if they were two separate things? Well, one answer to this question has already been given. If I can exist when my body does not, then I must be distinguished from my body, however closely identified with that body I may be. Two things that are separable must be distinguished, even if they are not currently separate in any way. But there is more to be said here. Even if the body is the form in which the soul or self currently exists, there is a reason, I think, why it is natural for us to speak of body and soul as if they were distinct entities. And that reason requires us to focus on the fact that our bodies can be and must be thought of in two distinct ways. When I use the term I to refer to myself, I normally mean to refer to myself as a conscious agent. I can hardly give a full account of what this means, but at a minimum it means that I'm conscious of myself as an entity who has mental states of various kinds, including perceptions and memories, desires, consciously conceived goals, beliefs about how those desires and goals might be achieved, as well as lots of other beliefs, and ultimately acts of will directed towards the actualization of certain possibilities in light of those desires and beliefs. And those beliefs include beliefs about the objective character of the world in which I act as a bodily agent. I know that if I want to be at place B, and I am currently at place A, I will have to move from A to B in some manner, and I know this will take some time and some effort, because I must do it by moving my body. My body is the form in which my self exists. If I want to achieve my goals, I must take account of the way the world actually is. I might wish that point B were closer to point A than it is, but my wishing will not change the nature of the physical world. I thus learned very early to distinguish my conscious acting self from the material world in which I act, 
a world which shows a certain indifference to my desires and a certain recalcitrance to my will. Now I think the human body plays a dual role in this picture. On the one hand, the self is a bodily self, and so my body is not simply another object in the world. It is the form in which I exercise my personal agency. As I said, if I move from point A to point B, I do so by walking or biking or otherwise moving my body. But my body is also experienced as an object in the world. It can and does exhibit the same indifference and recalcitrance as the rest of the physical world to my will. If my legs are trapped under a car, I will not be able to move from point A to point B, even if I want to do that. If a brain tumor invades a region of my brain that controls my motor functions, I may similarly be unable to walk and move. So for, first, for certain purposes, I have to treat my body as if it were just another object in the world, even though it is not just another object in the world. I find myself necessarily thinking of my body in two distinct ways. One, it is the locus of my agency, the form in which I exist as a conscious self, but two, it's also an object in the world, a physical entity which, like other physical entities, follows the laws of nature, doesn't always act as I want it to act. When we think of our bodies in the second way, we naturally think of it as something distinct from ourselves. We think of the body as if it were merely another object in the world, an entity whose characteristics I have to take into account when I act. And when I think of my body as a material object in this way, it is natural and in fact valuable to objectify it, to study it scientifically as one might study any other object in the world, even though, as I've said, none of us thinks of our body simply as another object in the world. Now, when I think of my body in the first way as the form in which I exist as a, as a self, it's not a mere object. It's just myself. When I think of my body as a physical object in the world, it's natural to think of it not as myself, but as something myself must take into account in its agency. And when I think of the body in the second objectified way, it is natural, therefore, to think of it as something distinct from myself. Hence, we develop the language of body and soul as if there was language referring to two distinct entities. And that language has a certain appropriateness, I've said, because of the possibility of life after death and because of this dual way that we all uh, think about our own bodies. However plausible it may seem, however, to identify the self with the body, I think it's a mistake. At least if it's a mistake if we think of the body merely as a physical thing, as an object in the world. Because of the unity of the self and its body and the legitimate ways that I objectify my body, it's sometimes legitimate to think of myself, a bodily self, simply as an object, a material thing. But I should never think of myself only in this way or merely in this way. I think there are two aspects of myself as a conscious agent that resist this sort of objectification. Consciousness and intentionality. These are the two features of selfhood that are, I think, the great barrier to uh, materialism. We know what it is like to be conscious because we are conscious beings. No third person account of the brain and its workings can fully account for this, however important the brain may be in causally producing such conscious states. Similarly, I think we know what it is like for our thoughts to have meaning because we think them as meaningful, we experience them as meaningful. Now, I call, uh, in, in some of my writings, I have developed a term, minimal dualism. I call minimal dualism the claim that the self and its body should be called distinct entities because of the possibility that one could exist without the other, at least through God's supernatural power. Physically, it may be impossible for you to exist without your body. Perhaps physically, it would only happen through a divine miracle. But if it's even possible through a divine miracle, then you are not identical to your bodies. Minimal dualism, in this sense, could be true, even if it were the case that during this life, your mental life, it would be completely a function of what happens in the brain and the central nervous system. 
since all minimal dualism presupposes is that through God's miraculous power, a person's conscious mental life could continue after death independently of the body, even if that's not possible now. Even this minimal truth would justify me in denying that I am identical to my body. But when I think of myself as a conscious agent, I find it necessary to go beyond minimal dualism to what I call significant minimal dualism. Significant minimal dualism says that I am not only a conscious self, but that when I think of myself as a conscious self, I must think of myself as an agent with causal powers. The conscious self is not merely an object in the world, a byproduct of neurochemical firings in the brain. We're agents. We're initiators of actions. Minimal dualism holds that the perspective I take on myself when I think of myself as a self is not an illusion, but a reality. Now, why should I think that significant minimal dualism is true? Part of the answer, I think, is that an understanding of oneself as a conscious agent is a presupposition of practical reason. We must believe that we are conscious agents because this cannot be consistently denied by any sane human being. To live a human life, even the most reductionist materialist must take a first-person point of view, which involves making decisions, choices, willing to act in certain ways and not other ways. But it's not possible to will a course of action and at the same time believe that one's act of willing is an illusion that makes no difference to what happens in the world. Even science is a human activity. Science cannot be pursued without humans who are rational agents who do things, who make choices, who will to do things. I think it is therefore irrational for anyone to hold on the basis of science that humans are not agents who make meaningful choices. Now, is such a perspective undermined by contemporary scientific research that shows how dependent our mental life is on our brains? I don't know enough about uh, neurophysiology to, to answer this question, probably myself. But I would submit that the total body of evidence we have, relying on the people who do know, that is what the, the neuroscientists say, suggests that our mental life, although it may be deeply dependent on our brains, is not simply a byproduct of our brains, that we do in fact have the kinds of causal powers that we take ourselves to have. It's true that we have much evidence that suggests our conscious life is powerfully shaped by what goes on our brains, but we also have much evidence that points to the fact that our brains are powerfully shaped by our thinking, by our choices, by our decisions. Of course, our everyday experience constantly affirms this. I think about walking to the soda shop for an ice cream. I decide to do it. Fifteen minutes later, there I am in the soda shop eating an ice cream. The materialist could, of course, assert that the apparent mental causes of my actions are just epiphenomenal byproducts of brain activity. But I think it's very difficult to, to live in accordance with that belief. Or consider the placebo effect. Why is it that when testing a new drug, scientists have to do double-blind studies in which some of the subjects in a study take a placebo? Now, it's well known that the subjects taking the placebo often improve, and often improve markedly. So for a new drug to be proven effective, it must not just help their subjects improve, it must help them improve more than the placebo does. But how does the placebo help them improve? I think the most plausible answer is the placebo helps them improve because people believe that they're taking a drug which will help them improve. Their beliefs, their thoughts have causal powers. I think this is powerful evidence that what I believe can have a significant effect on my body. Some research psychiatrists, in fact, I thought about bringing a book. There is a book that actually inspired my title tonight that I have on my desk back in Waco. The book says, You Are Not Your Brain. Uh, and it's written by a research psychiatrist at UCLA who has spent many years studying uh, people with obsessive compulsive disorder. Now, as is the case with several other mental disorders, there are strong correlations between obsessive compulsive mental disorder and certain kinds of abnormal brain configurations. 
The brains of those with obsessive compulsive disorder do tend to show characteristic patterns which can be detected in MRI scans. However, psychiatrist Schwartz, Schwartz has provided very powerful evidence that the connections don't run simply in one direction. His treatment program involves uh, a program of teaching people to meditate, uh, originally done with Buddhist meditation. And in less than 12 weeks, through cognitive training, Schwartz helps his patients overcome their obsessive compulsive patterns of behavior. And the interesting thing is that when they do another brain scan at the end of this 12-week period, it shows that the patients who have been meditating are at the same time systematically transforming the metabolic activity and even the microstructure of their brains. This seems to suggest that people are not simply the helpless victims of what happens in their brains. We are conscious agents and we also have the power, at least some power over time, to change our brains. The very same brain imaging tools that show a connection between brains and our mental lives also provide us with some evidence that the causal chains run both ways. We are not simply products of our brains. Now I think it is exactly for this reason that those Christians who have jumped on board the materialist bandwagon, such as Nancy Murphy and Warren Brown, uh, are quick to argue that their kind of materialism is, quote, non-reductive materialism. They don't want to say that we are just products of our brains. They also want to say that we as persons, as selves, have causal powers. So as non-reductive materialists, they champion the claim that humans are not just products of what is called bottom-up causation. They want to affirm the possibility of what they call top-down causation, in which our conscious thoughts and willings have causal power. But I would affirm that this shows that significant minimal dualism is true. It shows that when I think of myself as a self, as a self, I have causal powers, however intimately tied to my body that self may be. The conscious self is not identical with the body, at least not when the body is viewed simply as an object in the physical world. That same body must at least be understood as well as the form in which the self as a conscious agent lives its life. But I would argue self and body must be distinguished, the truth of the first person perspective affirmed. My conclusion is that Christians should continue to affirm the traditional Christian view that human persons are souls or selves, and that as such we are not simply identical with physical objects. But we should not think of our souls as ghosts that live inside us. Strictly speaking, we do not have souls, we are souls. However, on a Christian view, this in no way diminishes the importance of the body because we are embodied incarnate souls. My body is not simply a part of myself either. It's the manner or form of being of myself. I am at the same time holy soul and yet fully bodily. Wittgenstein says somewhere, the best picture one could draw of the human soul would be a picture of a human body. That to me seems right from a Christian perspective. Thank you.